welcome to everyone to LIT. Um, <clears throat> have you ever thought about what decisions players make in the game? Have you ever thought about what decisions players make in your training sessions? Have you ever thought about how you set up your training sessions, what decisions that they have to make as, as a result of that training activity? Today I want to uh, open your mind to an area of the game that may be uh, left one side for a lot of us. We might be doing it automatically, but are we doing it consciously trying to develop it? So this morning I'm, I'm going to look at three things. I'm going to look at what is decision making. I'm going to look at decision making in a game and then how we influence our training sessions and training activities to practice that decision making. Uh, for the player. So, there you are. You're sitting there and you want to gain possession of that ball. What will you do? Will you catch it? If you're going to catch it, what catch will you do? Will it be overhead? Will it be face? Will it be chest? Or will it be a low catch? Or maybe you might control the ball first touch in your hurley. Or maybe you might overhead bat and then run on and jab lift or roll lift the ball into your hand. Now all of these are going to be influenced by a number of factors. They're going to be influenced by the speed, the flight and direction of the ball. So the skill that you're going to decide what to carry out is going to be influenced by the speed, the flight and direction. But not only that, it's going to be influenced by your positioning on the field. Are you near goal? Are you far away from goal? But also the opposition, will they let you gain possession of that ball? Okay, so here's our gaining possession. But what happens if your players are poor at catching the ball overhead? Or maybe they're poor at chest catching? Well, their ability to catch, gain possession from catching is going to be limited now. But what happens if they're poor at overhead batting as well? Now the skills of gaining possession overhead are very limited. Therefore, reducing their ability to make decisions about uh, gaining possession. All right, so now, gaining possession. Well, you now have the ball. And you want to maintain possession of the ball, what will you do? Well, you might touch the ball in your hurley and return it back to your hand. You might take four steps. You might solo the ball. All right. So now you have gain possession and maintain possession. And you now decide you want to release possession. But what will you do now? You can hand pass the ball. You might strike the ball. But if you're going to strike, what strike are you going to do? Will it be from the hand or the hurley? Would it be from your left side or your right side? And at what level are you going to strike the ball from? Would it be from your ankle, your knee, your hip or your shoulder? Now you have decisions to make about releasing possession. <clears throat> you might also kick the ball. But what happens now if your, uh, if your player is weak or poor on, on the left hand side? Well, now their decisions about using that side are limited. Here's all our technical skills. <clears throat> your technical skills. So how good are your players at carrying out the technical skills? The more technical skills we have available to our players, the more decisions that they can make with that ball. But all of us here are working at county level or at schools level trying to improve the, the performance of our players. So can they perform all these skills at match tempo? And that's where the player survives in the wild. They survive uh, at match tempo. So we might bring in some players, depending on the age, 14, 15, 16, 17s, and they can perform those skills. But when the heat of battle comes up and the speed of play comes up, now they start to struggle. 
And that's our job then as uh, mentors of development squads and schools to help them perform those skills. Let's look at another scenario. All right. Here you are, cornerback. You're cornerback. The person in front of you is corner forward. <clears throat> so now, where will you stand? Will you stand behind? Will you stand beside him? Or maybe you might stand in front. What is going to influence where you're going to stand? Well, it's going to influence and depend on a number of factors. First, it depends on where the ball is. Is the ball close by or is it at the far end of the field? That is going to influence where I'm going to stand marking uh, the corner forward. It also depends on who has the ball. Has my team the ball or has the opposition the ball? If the opposition has the ball, what skill is going to be performed? Are they soloing? If they're soloing, it's going to take longer to come into my space. If it's just about to be struck by the opposition, it's going to be on top of me very, very quickly. So I need to be in a different position. And also think about where the ball will land. The ball might land inside. Well, if it's going to land in there, well, I better be marking my player from goal side. Or maybe it might land in front or coming in low. And the player might decide, well, I better get out in front. And also, it will also depend on who I'm marking. Am I marking someone really, really fast? And therefore, I might have to play in front. Or maybe I, I'm marking somebody catching the ball in the right hand. And therefore, I might stand on that side. All of these decisions are decisions made off the ball. The ball is outside of us. And this is what we call reading the game. Reading the game. Making decisions off the ball. Previously, we, we've seen decisions on the ball, but we have decisions off the ball as well. Okay, so to help us quantify it and coach it, well, we divide it into four W's. So here you are. As a player, <clears throat> the first W is what? What skill will I perform? What skill will I perform? Will I strike the ball? Will I solo? Will I catch? <clears throat> will I stay? Will I go? And then critically, when will I do it? When will I strike? When will I solo? When will I go? And timing that run is essential. Being there at the right time. Where? Where will I strike the ball to? Where is the ball going to land? Where will I run to? Where is there space? Where is my teammate? And that link leads us on to who? Who will I strike the ball to? Who is striking the ball? So my player is coming out on, my, on the left hand side and I know he's going to strike it, well, I'm going to be there. Or maybe who and where is the opposition? How often is it the case that we uh, have players and we strike the ball straight to the extra player? So their ability to read the game and, and make decisions both on the ball and off the ball is critical. So here. You are sitting in the car, driving here this morning. You put the keys into the car, you're able to turn the wheel, you're able to put the car into gear. You're able to turn on the indicators. Right? Technically, you can perform all those actions. But what is going to influence when you do it? Well, it's when you go out on the, on the, on the road. And depending on what comes in front of you, well, uh, you have to decide what action you're going to perform in the car. Will the car stay in its own lane? Will it come in across me? If so, I have to decelerate. Right? The lights, what color are the lights? I'm reading all that situation in front of me and then I'm making decisions about what technical skill I'm able to make. 
Right, for a minute, I, let's think about your players. <coughs> Technically, we have some very, very, very good players in our squads. But can they use that technical ability at the right time? Can they decide what skill to do? When to do it? Where to do it? And who to do it with? Can they be adaptable to the situation that's going on around them? Okay. All these decisions, well, we must think about that there has to be a purpose. There has to be a purpose for these decisions. And if we think about the game of hurling, well, we can divide these purposeful decisions into two. We have attack and defense. Right? And in attack, our main aim is to score. I have the ball and I want to score. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, we have a, f a few principles of attack. Well, we can keep possession. We can penetrate, which is get the ball near the goals. We can support our teammate by running up for a pass. We can keep uh, space by width and depth, but also keep mobility by moving. So that's decisions in attack. But what happens when we, we don't have the ball? Well, the opposition have the ball and we're trying to prevent a score. And we have some principles of defense. For example, number one, defend the goals at all cost. Put pressure on the ball. Delay. Delay the ball, delay the pass. Support. My teammate has gone to tackle to put pressure on the ball. Where am I going to run? And then depth. We want to keep depth and keep compact in defense. All right. So if we think about our development squads, and we think about our, perform, uh, our players, and if we, could, if we could quantify performance in some way, so let's say we had performance up along the, uh, the left, and then our age is along the bottom. And we would love the situation of this performance over time. Improving from 14s to 15s to 16s to 17s. That would be fantastic. And that is our aim as development squad mentors. Constant improvement. However, for some, it's like that. For more, it's like this. It goes up and it plateaus. How many uh, stars have we seen at uh, 14? Then they go to 15 and then they kind of fall off at 16 and 17. Or maybe even we have this situation. Brilliant, brilliant players at 14, 15, and then 16, 17, and they're nowhere to be seen. Players often getting player the tournament down in the Tony Forrestal don't even get near their county minor squad. So why is this? Well, there's a couple of reasons, or potential reasons. Well, during this stage between 14, 15, and 16, I, I, their bodies are transforming physically. There is rapid growth going on. And we, we know it as their growth spurt. More technical, uh, peak height velocity. And depending on the individual, some might be growing really, really fast at different ages. You might have a 14-year-old that's six foot tall. But you might also have a 14-year-old who is five, five foot. Now what happens when they grow, start growing really, really fast? Well, their bones start growing really, really fast. And then their muscles take longer to, to catch up. And as a result, if anyone is in, um, has performed a functional assessment on their players, they, they, they find lots of mobility and flexibility issues with them. They're just tight. And especially around their hips and their shoulders. Because when we're babies, we grow from our trunk outwards. But when we're teenagers, we grow the opposite direction. 
our hands and our feet grow first, then our legs grow and our arms, and then our trunk catches up. So suddenly, within that period of maybe uh, 6 to 12 to 18 months, we could have up to 11 centimeters of growth. So the body is used to uh, this uh, certain length, and overnight, if you like, over that 12 months, it has now a longer lever. And therefore, it's going to take him a little time to catch up, right? Be it uh, mobility and stability um, required. But more significantly, what about their, their movement skills? Their movement skills that they're used to catching the ball there, and now their hand is uh, further up, right? Or striking the ball. They're used to striking the ball. Now they're longer limbs and they're mishitting the ball. And more often than not, players lose that confidence because of that growth spurt. So it's important for us as coaches, especially around 15 and 16, uh, to understand that this growth spurt is happening, that some players might be um, going through that growth spurt and that challenge of extra um, mobility and stability factors and also their movement skills and to help them through that. So they need mobility, stability, but also they need movement skills and also skill refinement at that stage as well. But the other thing is if you think about our players and their grow and their starting collective training may maybe at five, six, seven now. And by the time you have them at sixteen, they might have ten years of coaching performed. So there's going to be improvement over time because they're going to be doing more training. But how can we make that good player better? And that is a big challenge for all of us. It's easier to, to pick out the faults of the, the weaker guys, technically or tactically or team play, and improve those. But can we improve the, the, the good player? That is good, say for example at 15. Our challenge, can we get them up there? Well, we need a knowledge of the areas and elements of the game to do that. So let's look at these. Now, you may have come across this. Hopefully you have. And it's the total playing performance. Right? Everything in that wheel is contained in the 15 aside game. We have technical ability at being the skills of the game. Catching, striking. Tactical, which is uh, decision making, knowing what to do, when to do it, where to do it, and who to do it with. <clears throat> Team play, can our players perform together? Another massive challenge for us, because think about the players that we're working with, they're probably and are the best players within their club. They're normally doing everything uh, for themselves in that club situation. Then they come into a, a county or school setup where there's multiple uh, players at that standard. And can they cooperate together? They may not be used to it. And many, many struggle at that stage. Physical fitness, yeah, being able to rep and repeat the skills of the game over and over and over again. Psychology. Psychology in the middle because it touches everything that we do. The player that comes in to us may be, may be thinking himself, I'm too good for this. Or may be coming in low on confidence now because of this growth spurt. Can you identify that player and help him and bring him up? So now we have a number of elements of the game. Can we identify and help that player in the element that they need? More often than not, there will be one element sticking out. But can we as coaches identify that element? So think about the elements for you. Where would you 
rate yourself um, in each of the elements. Is there elements that you say, yeah, I'm really, really strong at that. I'm really strong at decision making, or I'm really strong at technical, or team play, or physical. Or maybe there's elements that, mm, not so hot at that. And that is where we use the full management group of mentors. So maybe I'm strong at technical, someone else is strong at tactical, someone else is strong at team play, and that's how we set up our, our coaching. Okay, today all we're going to look at is decision making, right, and how we can actually improve decision making by the activities that we set up. So how do they make decisions? <clears throat> well, first of all, the, the signal must occur. Something has to occur. So the player now um, needs to receive that signal, and we receive it through the senses, maybe touch, hearing, and let's just look at vision. For example, the player is scanning and using his vision to spot what's going on. And then, once the signal is uh, gone into the brain, it must be understood. And that's what's known as perception. Now, perception occurs uh, after we uh, get that stimulus over and over again. So we know now that <clears throat> the more experience we have, we can block out the irrelevant information and choose the relevant information. So think about the, the high-level players, right? We're, we're, pre we're preparing them to play at the highest level. So they need to be able to block out irrelevant information like the crowd or, or uh, elements like that and focus on relevant signals. But what are these signals? Well, the number one signal is the ball. So we can help our players to identify that signal, the ball. And again, the speed, the flight and the direction are critical to tell us about what's going on and the decisions that we, we have to make. Not only the ball, but also my teammate. Do I know the strengths and weaknesses of my teammate? For example, my wing back is coming out with the ball and he's just about to strike it on his right hand side. I know he's capable of striking at 80 meters. Well, I might be in behind the defense. Or maybe my left half back is coming out on his left side and I know he's only able to strike at 30 meters or 40 meters. So in that situation, I'm coming short. So being able to read um, <clears throat> what the players on my team are able to do is, is, is really, really important. But not only that, what are the opposition able to do? Where are the opposition? So think about the opposition. How many times, as we said, oh, we hit the ball to them? Or maybe, what are the opposition able to do? Where are they strong? What skills are they strong at? So let's think about the game and what we're preparing them to play. Right? So we, we've touched on decision making and what, what it is. But let's just take you to one moment in the game. All right. So you're a coach. You're standing on the sideline, right? The, the opposition full forward is bearing down on goals. Your cornerback comes and he takes him out and it's a penalty. It's a penalty. Have you ever thought about the goalkeeper's situation facing a penalty? Well, <clears throat> for 18 years I played adult hurling. For 17 of the 18 years I played in goals, I had two players either side of me. And now last year, the rules changed to one-on-one. -on -one. Now the ultimate experience, <clears throat> me having to defend the whole goals by myself against their best penalty taker. One-on-one. -on -one. 
So now, when he strikes that ball, it can be traveling up to 141 kilometers an hour. 141 kilometers an hour. Now that's okay if he's a mile away, right? But he's only 20 meters away. Now that's going to be in my personal space in 510 milliseconds. 510 milliseconds. Now picture this. It takes you, on, a, on average, 200 to 400 milliseconds to blink. 200 to 400 milliseconds to blink. And this thing is going to be with you in 510 milliseconds. So if I wait to make a decision, when the ball is struck, it's gone in. So what am I going to do? I need to help myself to make a decision. Well, <clears throat> there's the goals. I might stand one side of it and help him and push him into the other side. I'm, instead of going down, I might stand up, make the goal, deny the goals, deny the space. I might take one step out or two steps out towards the wall because for every step uh, out I take, it's one meter less to defend. <clears throat> and that's all before the ball is struck. I need, also need more information. So I'm watching the player running up to the, up to the ball. What is he doing? Where is he going to lift the ball? How close or how far away from the ball uh, is uh, from, the, from his body is the ball? Because that's going to influence where he's going to hit it. When he hits it, is he going to strike it on the inside to turn it out? Will he strike it on <clears throat> the middle of the boss that's going to come straight at me? Or maybe he might strike it over the ball for topspin. The height that he's going to strike it at is also going to tell me where it's going to go. So if you look at the picture here and, and see the ball, where do you think the ball is going? It's going down, isn't it? It's going down. So in that three seconds, <clears throat> from the time he starts his run up to when he strikes, I've all those decisions to make. And now the ball is on the way. 141 kilometers an hour, 510 milliseconds. My ability to read that the, the player before he strikes the ball is going to influence whether I save it or not. And then you make the save, the ball is out and there's more decisions to be made. We can help our players to read their body language. We can help our players to read the signals of reading the ball, where it's going to land, how fast is it going. We can help our players to read our teammates. We can help our players to read the opposition. This will all help the player to make decisions. This is what you see. This is what you see on the sideline. The ball coming at you and going there. This is what I see, a spot coming at me. So it's critical if you want your players to be able to perform decisions at the highest level that you actually practice them. So now, let's take us to the All-Ireland Final. And let's look at some numbers to help us understand what kind of decisions the players have to make at the highest level. Because this is where we want to be. We want our players to be able to play at the highest level. So, for 30 seconds there with someone next to you, have a think about and chat about the total number of possessions that TJ Reid had in 74 minutes in the All-Ireland Final. Right, off you go, 30 seconds. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> right, we should have a number. Should have a number in your head. Should have a number. Here it is. 
the total number of possessions. Now, why is a possession? A possession is the time, uh, what he had, uh, how many times he got the ball into his hand. Into his hand. Were you close? Maybe you are. Maybe you aren't. <clears throat> so 17, 17 times in that 74 minutes, he had to make a decision about what to do, when to do it, where to do it, and who to do it with. That's on the ball. 17 times. Now let's think about the rest of the Kilkenny players and what they had to do. So let's think about TJ Reid, and he's all the way out there with 17. <coughs> think about Michael Fenley. Player of the match, Michael Fenley, 12 possessions. 12 possessions. Depending on where you play, may influence the amount of possessions that you get in the ball, uh, in the game. It's very limited, in 74 minutes. So let's think about the Galway possessions. From David Burke, 20 possessions, all the way out in front. TJ had 17, Burke had 20. And again, depending on where you play, may influence how many possessions you have. So now, for one minute, as a coach, what is this information telling you? Have a chat. What is this information telling you? <coughs> the number of possessions. So you, we, although the numbers are up there, we need to understand why, right? And what we're going to do about it. Now, players have limited possessions, but they need to be so efficient when they get that. Right? They, TJ had 17, yeah, but some others had five. Some others had three. Can they perform that skill, depending on what it is, the scenario that they're in, efficiently? And that is critical. So technical ability is so important. So important. So let's think now, we had TJ had the ball 17 times. What was his total time on the ball? 17, um, 74 minutes, 17 possessions. His total time in possession was? Forty-two seconds. Forty-two <coughs> seconds. Now that is less time than it takes him to run a lap of the field. Forty-two seconds. Now that's 2.5 seconds every possession. 2.5 seconds to make a decision. But 2.5 seconds to make a decision and also to execute that skill, depending on what it is. So let's look at TJ when he scored a goal. 2.5 seconds is the average. So there must be something faster. And when he scored the goal, which you'll see now, was 800 milliseconds. 800 milliseconds. The time you take to blink twice. Here's TJ here. So as the ball is coming in, he's reading the, what's Walter going to do. What position do I need to be in? Look at the technical ability of how short he's holding the hurley. Where is he putting the ball into the ground? So to ensure he scores. So TJ, 42 seconds, but how about the rest of the players and their time in possession? In black, it, uh, the time in possession. In yellow, the number of possessions. So TJ, all the way out in front, 42 seconds. Michael Fenley, 23 seconds for 12 possessions. But let me draw your attention to Killian Buckley. 
He had eight possessions and nine seconds. Now that's 1.1 second per possession. Now what is that telling us? Here's the Galway players. <clears throat> David Burke, again, 20 possessions and 35 seconds in possession. Now again, like, similar to the Kilkenny players, they had limited possession, but also limited time in possession. Can they perform all the skills that we've seen earlier on under time pressure? So technical skill is so important. But as important is when they use it. So now, <clears throat> I want you just to show you where TJ got the ball. In the first half, he had four possessions and here is where he got them. Mainly on the top side of the, of the pitch. And this is where he got the goal. <coughs> but in the second half, he had uh, ball possession on both sides of the pitch. He had to decide where to run, when to run, and what to do when he got there. But also he had different environment around him in all these different situations. So he's scanning the ball, scanning his teammates, and scanning the opposition. Let's look at how he got the ball. In white it shows us that he gained possession when the ball was near him, 20 meters away. Within 20 meters he, he gained possession. So he had to use his vision close by to gain possession. Let's look at the red ones. The red ones show us that he gained possession when the ball was 40 meters away. That was struck into his area. So he had to decide about when to run, where to run, and then what skill will I do when I get there to gain possession. Now, what were the Galway players doing when he was going to execute a skill? Remember, he had 17 possessions. For four, uh, <clears throat> we divided it into three things. Within two meters, he had space, right? Two meters plus. Within uh, a meter, with one person tackling, and then within a meter, with two or more people tackling. So, two meters space plus. This happened four times. Four times he got to execute a skill when he had more than two meters uh, around him. When we move him a little bit closer, within one meter and one person tackling, this happened ten times. So ten times he had to execute a skill under pressure from one player. And then finally, uh, uh, more than one player, three times. So the majority of the times he's under pressure executing that skill. So he's under pressure from time and also from opposition. The game demands of our players that they have to make decisions and e execute a skill under time and opposition pressure, with and without the ball. So this is critical that our players are skill efficient. They must be skill efficient to carry out those decisions. And now we see our game uh, evolving into more like the school ground game that we all used to play. That players have to be adaptable in multiple positions, multiple scores, multiple decisions, and multiple skills. Are your players ready to play this game? Because this is our role as development squad coaches to prepare them for this. <coughs> So now, taking us back to the, four, uh, the, the elements of the total playing performance. And every single one of them are equal to each other. Technical, very, very important. Decision making, when to perform that technical, just as important. But now in the last number of years, especially in the last 12 months, there's more of an emphasis now on uh, this, uh, strength and conditioning. Strength and conditioning. We have to be doing strength and conditioning. But if we're spending all this time on strength and conditioning, what's happening the time available for the others? Te 
technical just as important, decision making just as important, getting them to play together just as important as strength and conditioning. This is going to be a big debate for, for a lot of us uh, to, to rebalance. Okay. Finally, I'm going to move on now and look at how we adapt our conditions to influence the decisions that players have to make and help them make uh, better decision making. How many of, our, of us as coaches spoon feed our players? How many of us tell the players what to do, where to go, when to, when to go, and what to do when they get there? Or maybe when uh, they're uh, in their clubs, they have mentors spoon feeding them, telling them what to do. And when they come into you, they're poor at decision making because they've been constantly told what to do, where to go. So if we want our players to think for themselves, we have to create situations that they have to think for themselves. And adapt that situations to make it easier or harder for them to make decisions. So let's think about making decisions. How are we going to practice this decision making? Well here's three examples. Well we could design and play a game. We could set up a game situation, for example two versus one. Or we might video the performance, be it training or games, and then show them back and talk to them and questioning them about the decisions that they make. Once we have that game situation set up, well, we need to adapt it to make it easier or harder for them, depending on their own ability. And we can do that by using the step model, space, time or task, equipment of players. But let's see how. For example, we have a 10v10 and 4v4 area, uh, 4v4 players. What would happen to decision making if we increase the space available for them? Would it make it harder or easier? But potentially they have more space and more time to make a decision. What happens if we turn the pitch this way and made it length, uh, longer? Well, it would be easier to defend in width but it will be a challenge to defend in the length. Or maybe if we flick the pitch on this side, it will be harder to defend in the width, but easier to defend in the, in the length. What about the rules? What rules can we do? Well, currently we have four steps in possession and that are the time taken for, to complete four steps. To help our decision making, we can increase that to maybe six or eight seconds in possession, or six or eight steps in possession. Therefore, they have the ball and they have more time to look up and scan. Or maybe we want to increase the pressure on them and we reduce it to two seconds or two steps. Providing that real intense time pressure to execute that skill. Okay, the equipment, well, for example, if we have narrower goals, it's going to be harder to score goals, and it promotes points. But if we increase the goals, well, it's going to be easier to score goals, and it's going to be challenging the defenders to defend. What happens if we uh, include zones in the pitch? And we might focus on where the ball goes or where the movement goes, or the movement of the players. In the next five minutes, I want to see how many times can you get the ball inside the, the white zone. So now the forwards are trying to get in, but also the backs are trying to keep it out. Or maybe we include the players, and we have three players playing inside that area for the next five minutes. And finally, we look at the players. Here we have our 4v4 four four, uh, four players by 30 by 30 space. Well, if we increase the number of players in that area, it's going to put more pressure from tackling and time to make a decision and execute that skill. 
But if we reduce this, the players and we give the ball to the team in black, well, potentially they have less players to tackle them and they have more time to make a decision. But to make it harder, what about overloading the team in black? They play against 10 players. Now they have limited time to make a decision and execute a skill. <clears throat> so let's think now for a minute what your current activities include. Do you focus only on on the ball activities? Do you focus on off the ball activities? Do you allow the players to make decisions for themselves? Or do you try to tell them what to do all the time? Now, some game conditions that we set up practice poor decision making. For example, how many play a game six passes before you can score? You need to tell me. Right, six passes before we score. Right, I pass and I get it back on the third pass and I'm in for a score and I can't score so I have to turn around and make another pass. And our ultimate goal is to score. So I pass again and he's in for a score and he can't score because, oh, we need six. So now the conditions that we use may be practicing poor decision making. And as a result, the defenders stand back don't have to defend because they need six. And on five, now we'll press up. So the conditions that you have may be practice and poor decision making. So let's think about learning the game and helping the players to learn the game and read the game by playing a game. Now there's a big trend to play small sided games. Fantastic. Right, so think about, right, we'll set up a small sided game. What has it given us? It's given us tight uh, time on the ball. It's given us tight opposition near us, right? We're, we're moving around in the area. But if we add a goals, now we have attack and defense. Now players have to think about, oh, I need to protect the goals here. And when I'm in possession, I need to score. So it's more like the game that they're, they're going to be playing. But what is the number one skill performed to keep possession in that area? Hand pass, isn't it? Hand pass. I'll hand pass it, we'll run around, we'll hand pass it here, we'll hand pass it. What happens in the All-Ireland? If we think about dividing the pitch in half, right? And the Kilkenny on the left and the Galway on the right and the ball changes ends 73 times in that game. 73 times the players got the ball from end to end. Now, Kilkenny got it into the Galway half 35 times and Galway got it into Kilkenny half 38 times. So 35 or 38 times they had to look at the ball coming into their area be it from a short distance and long distance. And the majority of the time was perform long striking. And that is over 40 meters. So 27, 24 times they had to read the flight of the ball coming from more than 40 meters. Now let's think about this game here. What's happening in there? Hand passing and the ball is close by all the time. Now that is important because we know that, remember TJ got the ball within 20 meters and that's important. But what about the seven balls that he got from over 40 meters? And the 25 and 27, 24 and 27 times the ball went from end to end. The players in this situation are not getting the opportunity to read the flight of the ball. So let's think about applying our step principle to this to make it more relevant uh, to the game that they're going to be playing. What would you do with the game? Well, we might add another area. And now, yes, they have playing in a small area and they have to hand pass the ball, but they have to get it up to the other end. So these players on this end have to read the flight of the ball coming at them. And now they have to think about where to go, when to go, 
and what to do when they get there. Also, let's think about space. How are we going to help them? Well, we might increase the space at one end, so it's going to be harder to defend on that end. Or we might increase the space on both ends, making it harder to defend. We also might limit the space on one side, or limit the space on the other, making it easier to defend and harder to attack. Let's think about the time or the task. You might say two seconds in possession, two steps in possession, or ten steps in possession, or that. What about equipment? Well, for example, we might add in a zone. And when the ball is in this area here, that the play these two players have to be outside. And when it comes over, they can move anywhere. And now you're getting to teach them about depth and creating space. And then we might add the the zone into both sides. And finally, let's look at the players. Well, we might add the players to one end, making it harder on these to, uh, to attack and easier to defend, or we might add them to both ends. But the, the underlying principle that they must strike the ball over, over and back, making it more relevant for the game that they're going to be playing. So now, if we think about the, the helping the players make better decisions, well, we include a game situation. Learn the game by playing a game. And the more attacking principles that we have involved, and the more defensive principles we have involved, the closer it is to the real game the more that they'd have to perform technical, tactical, team play, physical, psychological, and perf uh, knowledge of their own performance. It's going to be more specific to the game that they're going to play. To summarize, to summarize, I want you to introduce you to Zola. And Zola is a tiger, obviously. And Zola lives in the zoo, right? And every day, John the zookeeper brings her breakfast, dinner, and an evening meal. And even if she doesn't want it, dinner is served. And in the evening time, their cage is open, and she goes in, and she has shelter from the elements, and protection from all the animals. Everything is done for her. Every day is the same. Life is easy. <laughs> Life is comfortable. But what about Eva? Eva lives in the wild. How does she get her food? Well, every day, if she wants to eat, she is going to hunt for it. And even with all her strength and skill, she will only be successful one in 20 times. Now, if she doesn't find food, she doesn't eat. If she doesn't find water, she doesn't drink. Where does she sleep at night? Well, wherever she wants. Wherever she thinks is safe. How does she protect herself? Well, she has to learn the skills to survive and protect herself. Now, what would happen if we put Zola, the zoo tiger, into the wild? How long would she survive? Well, not very long. Why? She may not know how to hunt for herself. She may not know how to protect herself. Why? Because she spent all her time in the zoo. Everything has been done for her. Now, how does Eva survive in the wild? She survives in the wild by being in the wild. She survives being uh, able to adapt to the situations and the skills necessary to survive in the wild. She has to learn how to protect herself. She had to learn how to fight for food. Every day was different. Now, do you recognize the zoo tiger conditions in your practices? You set up activities. You tell them where to go, when to go, and what to do when they get there. The players listen to you, 
and they follow your instructions, not having to think for themselves. What happens when the, these players go into the wild and chaos of the game? Well, their skills break down because under time and under pressure, they haven't been used to surviving in the wild. We as development squad coaches, our job is to perform, uh, pre prepare that player for the wild and chaos of the game. Have they enough skills to perform uh, left and right, gaining possession, maintaining possession and re uh, releasing possession? If they have, they will survive. If they think for themselves from the activities that you set up, they will be able to survive. My challenge to you, I encourage you from today, is to help the players su survive in the wild. To give them the skills necessary from technical, tactical, team play, physical, whatever skill that they need to survive. Tigers learn to survive in the wild by being in the wild. Players learn to survive and learn how to play the game uh, by being in the game. The game of hurling so many decisions, so little time. Thank you very much.